So next, next uh, talk is the uh, the kind of driving of cosmic units by uh, Eric. Eric. So let's go. Great, thanks for inviting me. Here. Uh, I just thought I'd put up my social doing theory, but there's a few images that subject, so a lot of people haven't seen this one. But I would just point out a couple things about it. This is the uh, NP2, I think, so that's the so the top. This is more or less going this way, and it's clearly not flowing this way and that way. Um, this does show the multi phase nature of that output, and that's something we should mention. The purplish stuff here is X ray emission. The red is either H alpha or um, also a dust emission spitzer. So you see the inner part of the cavity, a lot of hot gas. Um, you don't really see the hottest gas in which part around 10 million Kelvin. Uh, but it's low in the density that's very, very hard to see. Uh, there's some evidence for it. Show you some. This is just thermal emission. It's not um, but you know, on the, along the edges of it, moving at quite high velocity, there's, there's gas which is ionizing around 10 to 4 Kelvin. Is it, is it, uh, you can't hear me that well. Move it up a little closer to this. Oh. <laughs> is that better? Okay, good. Um, so I want to talk about one of the one of the physical mechanisms to push gas out of the galaxy like this. Um, and there's a number that have been suggested. Uh, and I think like in many cases actually it's a combination of a number of different things. So I'll try to describe it. So quick outline. I want to start off with the stuff that I uh, know best about uh, radiation pressure turbulence. And the reason is because you can scale things pretty clearly this way. And then you can compare the observed winds to those speeds. I'm not trying to argue that radiation driven winds are stable, it's completely not. But they do give you some physical intuition about how this kind of works. Um, so I'll describe in some detail actually the light driven winds, which we know for most stars, and also what I claim uh, Mark uh, 25 years ago uh, in BAL. Uh, um, then I'll talk about energy. So, so I call these momentum conserving winds rather than momentum driven winds. Okay. I'll come to that distinction a bit here. I'll then talk about energy conserving winds, thermally driven winds. Okay. Um, bombs, but I think it was bombs, okay, which includes supernova, pretty fun. But it can also include shocked stellar winds, those star winds, it can include shock broad absorption winds. Okay. Um, so I just some both those. I'll just briefly mention magnetically driven winds because I don't think they're relevant for most galactic outflows, except in the sense, in the sense that jets are quite likely to come magnetically driven. Okay. I'll also mention a bit about cosmic uh, ray driven winds. And I'll, I'll bring up this point that was discussed at the end of the last talk actually. How well do the aging in outflows of winds coupled to the galaxy? To the galaxy by the so feel free to stop me at any time to discuss this. So um, line-driven winds um, are seen from low stars. Uh, this is the classic example, I think, the discovery paper for that. It's more uh, from body uh, medium. Back in the 70s. This is showing a spectrum taken from that satellite. This is in the ultraviolet. This is the most wavelength of the mainstreams here. And, uh, the, the counts here is just the intensity, essentially. This is the Apophis, which is the most star. And you can see here there's a nitrogen 5 line at that, or double, I should say, at that wavelength. And uh, I'm an alpha at 1215. And you can see there's this emission and then a big absorption trough. Okay. Um, so that got everybody's attention back in the 70s. Lines like this with peak profile, we have emission. On the redward side of the line, we shift absorption. That had been seen from a star called P60, which is not a star. But it was, clear, it was interpreted as a wind. What's going on, of course, is that there's gas coming out of the surface of the star. It's ionized, it's nitrogen 5, obviously. Um, this, the gas between us and the star is flowing towards us, and you know that because you're seeing absorption, this blue shift. 
Okay, and it extends out to about 3,000 kilometers and stuff. So I'm just asserting that these are driven by those lines. In a way, you can actually see this from a, from a spectrum like this. This continuum bit is probably actually a bit high, I suspect. The is probably much lower down here. There are more lines that are doing absorption than just uh, nitrogen by combined now. You also see the lines that are less the spectrum, but a lot of this structure here is probably also absorption. Okay. If you just calculate, you know, there's, this is the resonance line, right? It's a transition from the ground state to the first excited state and back. So what you're seeing here is the photon comes along and it hits an ion that's moving away from the star at several, maybe a thousand kilometers a second here. The electron is picked up to the first excited state and then drops back down. So that transition is the resonance transition. It's very short-lived. And it emits a photon. And that's what's producing a lot of this emission up here. It's just scattered light from some other part of the wind, not between us and the star. Okay. That means that the gas is absorbing momentum from what's not quite a point source, but think of it as a point source. And it's radiating at more or less isotropic. It actually is both forward and backwards. It's a dipole sort of emission. I'm not about that. So what's doing is it's absorbing momentum from the, from the radiation. And you can see that you know it's absorbing a reasonable fraction. The, the, this is an OSR with a temperature of about 30,000 Kelvin. These absorption lines are near that peak. So some reasonable fraction, maybe just from looking at this, a tenth or more of the radiation is being absorbed and scattered by that gas. So you're absorbing momentum, which is L over C, the momentum coming out of the when you're in time coming out of the star, and you're, and you're putting 10, say 10 or 20% of that into this gas, and that's what's driving up to these very high velocities. And you don't need to know any physics other than that. Conservation of momentum is the top part of this. Okay. Now, observationally, what you see is the uh, wind velocity is typically, I grew up roughly, but it's about three times the state velocity on the surface. The mass loss rate times the lot of that velocity is the rate of momentum flow in the wind. Okay? And that, as I said, is, is comparable to L over C. So that really is momentum driving. You're taking, you're capturing some reasonable fraction of the momentum of the photon radiation coming out, and you're putting it into the wind. Okay? Now the wind is photoionized, the temperature is something like 10 to the 4 Kelvin, several times that. And yet it's going, as I said, at several thousand kilometers a second. So it's highly supersonic output. As far as the velocity is concerned, it's a cold wind. Okay. You're not driving this by heating the wind up and having it escape from the surface of the star, as is the case in the sun. And I'll come back to that case later. So this is a momentum conserving wind in the sense that, you know, there's a certain amount of momentum comes off the star in the radiation field. You tap into some fraction of that momentum, you just put it into the gas. Okay, so it comes from observations. Um, you can get it from radio emission when the wind produces free free emission. You can try to model the photonization of that uh, gas. That's kind of hard. That's a more uncertain estimate. There are several different types of estimates. That's observation. You can actually, if you assume it's line driven, I'll sort of show you this briefly if you want. Uh, you can try to calculate that mass loss rate. It is comparable to what people estimate on the observations. Yeah, that mass loss rate is coming from the observations. Okay, so talking about assuming line driven winds, this is from a classic paper by Castor Adam Klein. Uh, talking about the theory of wind driving, so I thought it was some equations up there. It's pretty straightforward in a way, right? But this is the momentum equation. It just says that, sorry, the mass equation, mass conservation. And, and we're assuming now a steady state wind. If these stars live several million years. Um, the wind dynamical time is the radius of the star divided by 3,000 kilometers a second. It's very short, much less than millions of years. So the wind is pretty much in a steady state. Okay? And so that way you can just drop the dvdt terms. Right? So that's what's been done here. And if you do that in, in the continuity equation, the uh, mass conservation, it just says the n dot is 4 pi r squared pro b. Right? That's the momentum I mean, mass equation. The momentum balance equation. Again, you've got the dvdt term here. So this is the convective derivative of the spatial part of that. There's the gravity of the star. This first term with the one here is L over C, that's the momentum per unit time in the radiation, and then it's 
uh, sigma e um, times f, that's the opacity, essentially. So that's the opacity. So that's just saying this n agent's argument, right? The electrons are being pushed by the photons. They're trying to push the gas out. Um, it turns out, of course, not surprisingly, this term is smaller than that term, although not by a lot. Right? We're basically could be from a tenth to like half or three quarters of those terms. Okay? This term is the pressure gradient term. But they just said that gas pressure is going to be small because the sound speed is, you know, for 10 to 4k gas, it's 10 kilometers a second or something. And the velocity is here more like 3,000, so that term is going to be small. Not definitely negligible, you can't ignore it completely. And then there's this funny term here, M of T. Okay? And what that is, it's trying to account for the line, the absorption of photons by the lines. Right? And uh, I'm not going to explain how all that works. You can go look at the paper, but basically they're adding up a bunch of opacity from a bunch of lines. If you just look at the optically thick lines, that opacity is proportional to the velocity gradient. That's easy enough to see, right? The line width. Of a, of a given ion, if you think of part of a bunch of a pack of the gas, the line within there is going to be just a thermal line. And if I said, as I said, that's about 10 kilometers a second. And if a photon goes through that gas, if you're within 10 kilometers a second of that line center, you'll just be absorbed and otherwise not. Okay. As it turns out, that doesn't produce a, a really big acceleration. Um, on the other hand, if you have a shear, if you somehow establish the width of the velocity shear in there, then, then the ions. At each individual location, you only absorb photons within the thermal line of the line center. But now you've got atoms at many or ions at many different velocities. Okay. So you can, you can spread out the velocity of the atoms and catch more photons. And that's what that first plot was showing. You spread out the ions and they're catching a lot of photons. So that's what this M of T term is supposed to be doing. It's accounting for that. Okay. As it turns out, it's not just the optically thick lines that matter. Optically thick lines are also important. As I was sort of indicating, let me show you that first spectrum. And so this term, which depends, as I said, on the velocity gradient, depends on V, that one dv dr. So this term appears on both sides of this equation. Over here, it appears nonlinearly. And it looks like dv dr is some power, which is somewhere between one and a half. Right? So what this paper does is Castor Abbey Klein does is it, it solves that equation. I have one more. Uh, actually, they show here. Uh, if you plug this stuff into there and, and use this expression that they have for that line force, here's their. They, they use this equation to eliminate rho. Right there. Um, and then, so the end equation looks like this. This sort of this part, for people who look, look, work on a solar wind, that should look familiar. That's just saying this. There ought to be something like a sine point in this one. Okay. That's gravity again, and now they've subtracted off the part here due to the electron scattering. They've expanded out this gradient, and there's explicitly that B and B and R term. Now, sort of physically, you can kind of stare at this and figure out what's going to happen, right? B and B and R, that's an acceleration. That's the that's the pushing on the gas, and, and that's going uh, to uh, be produced by, first of all, there's a negative acceleration due to gravity, gm over r squared, slightly modified by the heading to ratio. These terms, far from the wind, aren't going to matter much. And then there's a, the radiative acceleration term here. Right? The only sort of physical scale that's set in here for the acceleration, though, is in fact gm over r squared. Right? This B, dvdr is the variable you're trying to solve. Its, its scaling is going to be set by this one, essentially. Okay. And what that means is, if you're going to have a wind, this term has to be bigger than that one. Okay. But it's going to scale roughly like that, because if you get too much shear here, you're going to catch um, too many photons. Um, this term will try to run away. It can't. And if you don't catch enough photons, you'll have to you know, decrease to dvdr. But the parameter that actually gets adjusted is in fact this DMT mass loss rate. Okay. So to get this way to work, you have to go to a critical point. And the critical point determines, the flow at that point determines how much mass is actually pushed out in this linear theory. But you don't need to know what that is. Just the fact that the scale is like gym over r squared tells you that the wind is going to have a velocity which is comparable to the escape velocity. Okay. Uh, 
large fraction of the luminosity is absorbed in bias. Uh, it's typically about half or a little more. Three quarters. Buffering, actually, buffering. In, in the wind, in the in the in the wind, and the wind accelerates out to its terminal velocity after several stellar radii. So it's within several stellar radii. Then you capture magnetic stuff. And any given thin shell, uh, you won't be you'll get you know sort of uh, less than a percent of the radiation because basically the ratio of the sound speed to the, the velocity. And the sound speed is about ten kilometers a second, the velocity to the plus is a thousand, so you get five percent. Any given local region. But you smear this gas out of the large range of radius. This is. So that we can have a part of the big gravity. No, it's not actually. It's, I'll come in a second. It's, the solar wind is set by the heat rate. Which, for us, is a big parameter because we don't know what the hell the heat rate is, but there's some heat rate that physics actually says. But in these equations, it's a big parameter. Right? No, I'll show you a second. It's not. Yeah, that's uh, that's not actually commonly realized. It's not a good one. It's set by the heat rate. Because yeah. you, you have the same thing you have to go to the point and figure out how much heating you have to have. I just want to point out that I was talking about old stars, but here's the spectrum from a uh, quasar. Um, some funny phone number there. This is from paper by Patrick Vogel. Um, and this is um, 1550, that's carbon four, so that's the carbon four line. Uh, that's silicon four. There's lime and alpha. And you can see there are these emission lines, so, so the continuum sort of nominally does something like this. So there's emission on the red side, absorption on the blue side, emission on the red side, absorption on the blue side, etc. So these are peace saving profiles just like the other stars. Right. And again, you can do the same calculation. You can say, okay, what fraction of the momentum in that radiation field is being caught by these lines? And the optically thick lines, you can see this is near the peak of the these things typically turn over right around 1,000 inch Um You're catching maybe 10%, 5% of that radiation, just in the visible residence lines. Okay. Yeah? Oh, well, isn't it also true that in most of our particular, it's much more blanketing uh, to the, the lighter side of a line up, but we like to see. Then there's a bunch of residence lines you don't generally see, and you expect that it should be even more blanketing. Actually, getting more of the driving force from light bulbs. In the in the uh, quasars, you can see them. You look at them at high redshift. In the, in the when you do get a break in the luminosity of above about a thousand inch, so there's not as much of that effect. In, but you actually see it in the quasars. I didn't have a spectrum here uh, going to the far you, but you can actually see. Yeah, you see oxygen six, nitrogen. I mean, uh, neon eight. What's that? Perfect. Yeah, all kinds of high. Uh, ionization potential lines, and they do absorb farther out of the UV. So if you add all those up, it does come out to a certain extent. And again, that part doesn't require any theory. You just look at the spectrum and tell you you're capturing that fraction of the LOC into this gas, which you know is out of In this case, this stuff's going, in this one, I don't know, maybe 10,000 kilometers a second. Okay. Maybe faster. All right, energy-driven winds. So that was momentum-driven winds. Now I'm talking about energy-driven winds. I should say energy-conserving. I should change that. So this is just the solar solar wind. This is a classic Parker sort of thing. You do you start with the same two equations: the, the continuity equation and the momentum equation. You eliminate the density using the continuity equation. You assume we get the same state because again, the sun's a lot older than that at the time of the wind. So this. Parker's classic equation, and here there really is a pretty straightforward um, side point. When the sound speed is equal to the outflow velocity, this term goes to zero, so the right-hand side also has to go to zero, so you just solve for r there. Just look at the name of those r's, so that gives you the sine radius. And it's comparable to the solar radius. Right, so the photograph for the surface of the star. Um, now beyond the sine radius, at the sine radius, these two terms are equal. As you go to a larger radius, this one decreases faster than that one. So the, the only force that matters is not gravity, it's, it's the, this pressure gradient term that drives them into higher velocities. Okay. Um, and you just sort of, if you just ignore that term, you can solve it and ignore this term, you can just solve that. It says that the velocity goes like um, the velocity at the sonic point times a half plus uh, the log of r over r sine. Okay. 
In other words, you get a logarithmic correction to the velocity at the side point. In other words, basically, the terminal velocity is going to be fairly much comparable to the sound speed at the surface of the star, but that is the escape velocity at the surface of the star. Okay, so you get the same result. The wind velocity is basically a little bit bigger than the escape velocity at the surface of the star, even though you're driving it a completely different way. Okay. <coughs> All right. So I say here, uh, if all two stars are in hypostatic equilibrium and the stellar radius is comparable to the sonic radius, uh, and, and of course this requires that the sound speed has to be above order the escape velocity in order to get a wind. Okay. And that's sort of puzzling if you think about stars, because normally the surface of the star like the sun is 6,000 Kelvin, 5777. And the wind's got to come off at several hundred kilometers a second, so it's got to be highly supersonic. Well, no, it's not. The wind comes off of a region, essentially the corona, which is hot. So it's got to be up hot. Now, why it's hot, that's a different question. But there's something causing heat. Alright? So the mass loss rate is 4 pi x rho again times that sound speed. So it's set by the density at the sonic part. And in terms of the heating rate, which you need, the mass loss rate is just Q over the escape velocity squared, so it's not a free parameter. It's just set by whatever you decide to keep it. Now, because we're ignorant to us, it's a free parameter, so we don't know what the is, but that's physically what's going on. And so, right, Q, you can think of that as L, is it's an energy per time, so luminosity. So instead of being L over C times V win, this is L over V win times V. So instead of the speed of light, you're putting in the escape velocity. Okay. It's heating of the gas in the corona or due to some sort of MHD effect problem. Okay. At the surface of the sun, the gas is cold, we have a lot of turbulence, a lot of convection. So magnetic fields are moving around all the time, and they're reconnecting, and uh, they're being shaken by sound waves. So there's a lot of reasons that there's a lot of flux of energy in magnetic waves. What what you also learned was that if one connects the love link to the bottom, then you don't have a shift. You have a constant problem. Exactly. Otherwise, you have, you have to. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah. our ignorance. It's yeah. our lack of understanding. Usually, you assume an equation of state. That's really that. That exactly. Right. But in principle, right? We're all physicists. We can sit down and calculate the wave heating rate and just say, oh, there's that answer. I tried to do it once using sound waves. It almost worked. But it wasn't so the wrong place. The sound waves probably didn't crash. A little too far down. You've got to heat the plasma well out, out to many solar ray gases. It's probably a wave. Alright, so so the point is both these things act the same way. And the reason is because they're continuously driven. Oops. The wind velocity naturally comes out to be more of the escape because you're solving the momentum. And the star isn't blowing up, you're just blowing a little bit of fluff off the surface. So it's a perturbation at some level to grab. The mass loss rate is either L over C divided by V wind or L over C L divided by V wind squared. So there's momentum conserving the energy. So the scan is actually, you know, they, they come out of the momentum equation. Not behind uh, the solar the star. What's that? Half an hour. Half an hour. All right, there are other things that can drive outflows. Uh, <coughs> so one of the things that people uh, will actually clearly do drive outflows in nearby radio galaxies, but also in um, galaxy clusters are aging jets. So I'm just going to sort of one of the standard pictures so you can see it. Um, and so what you're supposed to see here is there's, so this is in radio, so there's some radio source right there, and there's a, there's a little bit of galaxy that's sort of like that. That's my question. And then there's these thin lines coming out, those are the jets. And then there's a lot of radio emission out here where the jet is currently running into some risk of resistance and shock and re exciting the superfundamental electrons. Okay. But these things can push on the surrounding uh, inner cluster medium or uh, the gas in the halo surrounding the big galaxy. Okay. Now, the luminosity of the jet is basically. The Lorentz factor times the mass loss rate times C, but that mass loss rate is really hard to determine, and it may be different for different jets. Okay. So normally, what you do is do it back. You find some thing like this, try to calculate the amount of energy in there. 
you make up some time scale, you divide it to, say that's the luminosity of the jet. Okay. They can be driven either by magnetized accretion disks, okay, around black holes, that's like a plan for pain. Basically, you've got a disk that's going around, it's got a bird magnetic field, the magnetic field can get uh, lay out of it, and you can centrifugally accelerate gas uh, along those field lines. And that is seen in protostars. There's reasonably good evidence for that. Um, you can't see anything from any GM. Um, or you can do it by, uh, if, 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 if the black hole itself is spinning, and you can attach field lines to it by creating, again, the disk. Um, you can actually tap the energy in, in the black, spinning black hole. But that's the black side. So either one of these are plausible sources for aging and jets. Okay, and just remark in that latter case, the jet mass can exceed the accretion mass of the black hole, which there is again some evidence for that in some cases. All right, so what's another way? So jets is the jets you can push either just directly like in that picture, and that is you're using the momentum for jet. So that's again a momentum driven sort of outflow. But you can also drive out those using bombs. Okay. So what do I mean by bombs? So I just want to have some examples. Supernovae, they're bombs. You can have O-star winds when they run in the interstellar medium. Okay. You can have the equivalent thing if you take a broad absorption line, which is momentum driven, and it runs into the interstellar medium of the surrounding galaxy and shocks atmospheres to set up a bomb. You can shock jets, produce a lot of thermal energy, or cosmic rain energy, they amount to the same thing. Uh, and, and so all these things, they're bombs because the sound or propagation speed greatly exceeds uh, the drill velocity with the bulk of the gas that you're running into when you're trying to push around sits. Okay. I mean, if you have a hot gas you're running into hot gas, there are no shocks or anything like that, it's not really a bomb, it just sort of pushes gently on the surrounding hot gas. In this case, you're having this gas which doesn't have to be hot initially, it can be cold, but it's running a lot faster than the sound speed of the gas it runs into. And it shocks. And now you get a hot gas, which is, has a sound speed which greatly exceeds the surrounding the sound speed of the surrounding gas, and that's a bomb. Okay, it's going to push out at a velocity way above the velocity of the gas, and things happen. Okay, so I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on supernova. Just just go through some numbers. We believe, for reasons which aren't entirely clear to me, actually, that the typical supernova produces ten to fifty one orders of ten. Um, the ejected velocity is basically the square root of 2 over divided by the mass that's ejected in the supernova. Typically, that's several solar masses or five. And I infer that because when you look at supernova, the typical velocity is like 5,000 kilometers a second. If you plug that in here, you get, you get five solar masses, which is okay, fine. These are stars that used to be 20 solar masses or more or whatever it used to be. So you're throwing out five, you have to get rid of a lot of mass in the meantime. So you got rid of that by stellar wind. Um, the stellar winds are coming out of velocity is not that different from this. So that's why stellar winds can act like bombs too. Um, the momentum in the supernova is the mass of the ejector times the velocity of the ejector. It's of order 10 to 43 grams per, gram per centimeter per second squared. And if you divide by the total stellar mass it took to make that supernova, in if you have an IMF that you think they understand, to make one supernova, you need uh, basically 100 solar masses of stars. And the um, velocity that they call spark is about 150 kilometers a second. All right. So that's the amount of momentum you get for a supernova. All right. Well, it turns out that's comparable to the momentum that comes out in an L star, O star wind. You know, it has a momentum that corresponds to about two or three hundred kilometers a second. So we can look at what supernova why they such a big deal, it's just be careful with the radiation. Well, it's because they turn into bombs. When supernova goes off, it just flies out freely to begin with, and then eventually it notices, oh, there's an ISM around here. And when it runs into its own mass in the ISM, it shocks, and then it heats up to 10 to 9 Kelvin or whatever, and then it cools off pretty rapidly because the gas gets driven into the center to maybe 10 to 7. Okay. But you still have all the energy that's in that gas. It's, it's, it's um, diffused enough that the radiative cooling time is much longer than the time of the first shocks. And so the energy just sits inside of this thing. And it's a much higher, you know, the pressure is just that energy, 10 to 50 when Earth's divided by the volume. And until the volume gets to be like 20 parsecs or something, 
that pressure is way above the ice. Okay. So it pushes on the material that's been shot. Eventually, that's how it cools the shot material closes. You have a nominally sort of a, a balloon around your hot gas, and it gets pushed out by the hot gas, and that pushes on the ice. So for this phase, it conserves energy as long as you're not radiating the energy away. Um, the shot just heats up the gas, but it doesn't actually change the energy. It converts kinetic energy into thermal energy. Okay. That phase ends when the enclosed gas cools. Typically, that happens when the momentum, which has been increasing all this time, right? You've been pushing on this stuff, is around 3,000 kilometers a second. So, so that goes up by a factor of 20. So that's why supernova are much more effective at pushing the ISM on the radiation. Now, after that, the expansion conserves momentum. So, are galactic winds that are produced by supernova are they energy driven or momentum driven? Well, they're both. The energy conservation phase put a lot more momentum in the outflow, and then that momentum is going to push on the ice. Uh, there's been a suggestion that the VL ones could do the same thing. And when they run into the ISM and kill parts after the larger scales, you can also shock and produce. You can also drive winds with cosmic rays, but put a question mark up there. Because uh, if you look at people's simulations, in fact, it, it sort of is only marginal. It's not enough to drive enough mass loss rate to produce the observations you see. So, this is from a recent paper by Gershius et al., and it shows three different simulations here. It's a, it's a slice, not a whole galaxy. This is where they just put in a supernova, they put in a certain amount of gas. They put in the star formation rate corresponding to that amount of gas on the mechanical speculation, set off supernova. And they see that the disk gets disrupted, but they see sort of funny windows in there. But it doesn't drive much of a wind. If they put in only cosmic rays and no supernova, they, they get a, first of all, a puffier disk. You can see this is this is the units of killed parsec, so that's one killed parsec, one and a half. This disk is maybe 300 parsecs. You see how high this is puffier compared to this one. And when they put it both, they get a puffier disk in. And you can see there's some outgoing gas here. And they claim that there's a wind here, but in fact, there's a couple things that are interesting. So, first of all, the call density here is about 10 solar masses per square parsec. The star formation rate is, if you did it with whole galaxy, it would be a order of solar mass per year. The cosmic ray energy density, which is what's down here, you probably can't see it. The scale there is. Um, 10 to the minus 11. This thing is set up to look like the Milky Way, but the cosmic ray pressure they got, they picked the diffusion pressure, is at least 10 times higher than the cosmic ray pressure in the Milky Way. Well, that, that doesn't sound right. And then you go to the next, then you look at, okay, so here's the plot of um, velocity as a function of uh, so this is the I should say, and um, this is density. And then the, the histogram just shows you how much gas there is. And in this case, this is just a supernova case. They get velocities up to several hundred kilometers a second. And there's some stuff even faster than that. Here's just cosmic rays alone. The velocities get up to um, what's that, 50 kilometers a second. I don't think anybody just going to call that a black wind. Right? And if you have both, you actually suppress some of the cost of some of the emissions from the supernova wind. And you get up to a couple hundred kilometers a second. Now, the mass loss rate in the wind, they say, is comparable to the star formation rate. But they're counting all the gas that has a positive velocity. They count stuff that's, well, say, 100 kilometers. It's much smaller. Yeah? How are they dealing with the cosmic rays? Is it anisotropic diffusion or uh, streaming? or? So these people were using anisotropic um, okay. diffusion. Mm -hmm. So there's big arguments about whether streaming right. matters more than diffusion right. or not. As far as I can tell, neither of them work. Oh, OK. Yeah, you can ask me about it after. Oh. Here's another example. This is a pack more at all uh, using. They have streaming in this one. I think they only just use the just have streaming. Here's the star formation rate as a function of time in their galaxy. And here's the mass loss rate in the wind as a function of time. Um, so this the star formation rate is two or three or whatever. And the mass loss rate is more unity. So. Uh, that's a mass loading factor of about a third. But this is a halo of 10 to the 11 solar masses. 
and the four mass loading factors that you need to explain you know, what people want to explain is cosmological simulations between mass loading factors of like 20. So again, this, this does not work. Okay, I want to say something about um, one other thing, which is suppose you take supernova and you blow gas out of, out of the galaxy. If you didn't do anything with the ISN, you'd have hot gas. As it goes out of the disk, it's going to adiabatically cool. Could that produce cold gas in the outflow? The answer is yeah, it could. Um, and that's been suggested by a number of people, including Tim Peckman, like 10 years ago. But I just want to put in uh, one observation, which I thought was interesting. This was um, Kate Rubin. She had a lot of, she was doing a galaxy galaxy absorption studies. And this was the background galaxy she was using to study the foreground wind. But when I saw the spectrum, it was a beautiful P signal profile at the redshift of the of the background galaxy. I said, well that's more interesting than the foreground galaxy. Why you you better split on that background galaxy. Why you just plot, you know, as a, as you go along the so here's wavelength this way, and this is distance along the split. So here's emission from the galaxy. And the galaxy's like this, and the split is put this way. But you go up here, and you know, the galaxy's right where the disk is, and then you go off the disk and it gets dimmer. With magnesium 2, which is this pebble right here, you can see there's uh, emission here and here off the disk, and then absorption in the disk. So that's the piece that you profile. And so she put in a model for the disk emission and subtracted it, and you can see there's this emission here and here. And, and she tried to fit that, and she sees emission pretty clearly up to around 10 kilometers, sorry, 10 kiloparsecs off the disk of the galaxy. This is magnesium too. That's low ionization states and gas is 10 to 4 Kelvin. And you're seeing it over a over a bare fraction of the disk, maybe it's you know, 3 to 4 kiloparsecs in radius. And you're seeing it 10 kiloparsecs off the disk. The adiabatic cooling only goes like 1 over R, so the gas only cooled by a small factor. Okay? And yet you're seeing gas is 10 to 4. So that's not gas in a hot wind and cool. That's just gas that got pushed out. Now, how you push out gas, this, this velocity is not that high, it's a few hundred kilometers a second. How do you push out gas that has a sound speed of 10 kilometers a second at several hundred kilometers a second and don't turn it into ionized gas, I mean, really hot gas? I don't understand. But it happens. A question? Yeah. Could it also be that it got you um, pull out much uh, lower temperature gas and then ionize it by the um, Luminosity of the galaxy. I think that has to be what's going on. Okay. Yeah. But, but that's a trick, right? Okay. You're pushing on a dense gas, you're hitting it with something that's going a thousand or two thousand kilometers a second, and you don't just shock it to you know several thousand kelvin, I mean several uh, temperatures of like ten to the seven. You leave it a ton. It's a well, new trick. It was what happened in our wind simulations. Okay. And then how about one day? Yeah, no, I agree. So well, we can talk about that later. If you do entrain gas, usually this is a better problem than you try to do that. The gas gets disrupted before it gets entrained very well. No, I think that's what's going on. What's yeah. Um, just following up on that, in your uh, previous slide, the headline was, could it be cooling? So why could that be the explanation? Could it be cooling? Yeah, that, that the cooler gas so, at high velocity is actually cooled gas rather than so the cooling time is way longer than the dynamical time, orders of magnitude. As is the, the adiabatic cooling isn't enough to bring you from 10 to the 7 down to 10. That's why it can't be. So in your headline, are you suggesting that that's therefore not? I'd say it's probably a train, which is what he was suggesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess I feel like it's like, 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 I was talking about Gallus question before, where uh, so, Cool adiabatically all the way down to the point where the radius comes from. That uh, what matters is what cooling time is the gas at the source, not the surrounding. We can talk more about that later, but I'm not sure this is a question. You're saying that you heated it and then it cooled right away in the ISM? Uh, yeah, if, it, if you ask me, you know, what's the cooling time of the antithetic where it sits? It's still longer than long. the dynamical time. But uh, the cooling time of the gas is quite severe. No, it's not actually. It's, it's still too cold. If you, if you take gas and sit the temperature on the density of the molecular clouds at 10, and shock it up to a high temperature.
captures you get to. The cooling time is longer than the back. Oh, it depends on metallicity. What's that? It depends on metallicity. It's slower than metallicity. It's just a smooth slope. But it's not the uh, open What's that? When you are at solar metallicity and then quite the process, you are in the best of the best. It's still. Um, so you gain that compared to normal low metallicity as you gain 4 or so 9. Yeah. If I take to the 6 scale, of course. No, it's, it's still. As, as you go further, that's where you gain. You can't go very far when you, when you are quickly, but there is a sweet spot where metallicity gains over. If you just do the calculation, assume it's 10 minus 22, which is the P of the slope. Yeah, this is not assuming free treatment, this is assuming you're. They're using atomic lights to pull it at the peak. It's not close, that's the point. It's not even close. Right. I mean, <coughs> way down. Yeah. So that would be uh, another way that you could have. This is what is it, a few hundred villages per second, right? Yeah. yeah. So is that uh, when. Well, that's what you observe the cool gas. Yeah. If you shock something and, uh, and don't entrain it by pushing out using ram pressure. That hot gas is still coming out at probably a thousand kilometers a second. Right. And that's the gas that you're claiming is going to cool. So, the other channel could be that, you know, since you see always that the hot gas is, uh, even if it's only like, uh, the clouds would not be like, uh, there's another channel that the clouds uh, were not directly entrained by the hot wind, or uh, fast velocity wind, which would have like uh, uh, broken the whole cloud in uh, channel. In, um, shock. But what else would be that uh, usually we all often observe that uh, there is a contact distance in the, the, um, the wind gets shocked, there's contact distance in And when this contact distance will rise from the disk, you already have some in gas in, um, blocked in the contact distance in which expands and then uh, into the second galactic medium and breaks into the uh, in relatively Well, as I say, we do simulations of this. People have had a hard time maintaining the uh, cold gas as it accelerates up to several hundred kilometers a second. Typically, it gets disrupted and heated. Uh, so, that's the point is that it isn't since the contact is continuous. No, the contact continuity gets disrupted because there are many instabilities to the globe. There's a couple of instabilities and many kinds of switches. They break up the cloud and disrupt the contact. So, please talk about the, the uh, CGM gas. Oh, it's all in CGM yeah, gas. Yeah, that's, that's a different yeah. story. Yeah. I, I was reading some this is not CGM gas. No, no. Right? This stuff here that you're seeing is not CGM gas. Uh, what they mean is that, uh, okay, maybe I don't think I'm talking about Yeah, maybe we better talk about this later. Yeah. Well, so this is an interesting question. Right? Can you push cold gas out using hot gas? Right? And I had great hopes for it. Um, Ten years ago, I've seen many simulations. And most of the time, the conclusion is this. So I'll, I'll mention this tomorrow, but we think that if you mix the hot gas with the cold gas, then that has a short cooling time and it seems to do it. I'll talk about it tomorrow. No, yeah, yeah, but you have to push on that cold gas. you got to push enough force on it to push it. So you can mix it, but you're still going to shock it. Right, it's that mixing and shocking that produces intermediate temperature gas, which has short cooling times. Okay, so you got to keep the density low. Like, you you, no, you, the, the density goes high. That's yeah. what. Yeah, that's what helps. Right. Well, people are so I want to say that in fact, bonds may end up resulting in what are essentially momentum-driven winds. Uh, this observation: the bulk of the mass that you see appears to be in gas. <coughs> hot. I mean, the molecular levels seem cold than a bit here. Um, so the rate of cooling times typically are long compared to the stuff that you're just launching. That's what I was just saying here. So you, you, know, you have to be careful. You can either fluidly fast or not shock it in the first place. Um, so this is what I said yesterday. So probably the cool gas is ram pressure driven from the hot gas, or it could be rated to a different All right. So this comes back to the point that was brought up earlier. You do run eventually run into the certain black community. Okay. And when that happens, you're going to have another shock. Blow up up. So this is just from a recent paper by Paul Martini. This is M82 again, um, and uh, it's just showing a PV diagram of their tracer. And 
and this is near the galaxy, you can see that as you move off the disk, you speed up, but then as you go farther away, you see slower moving paths. Okay. So naively you say, oh, the gas is accelerating and then decelerating, which is at some level true. I think what's happening is gas has come out, it's shocked against the certain galactic medium, that slows down a lot. And now you're seeing a bubble in projection, and that's why you see this sort of behavior. So that's not a launching mechanism anymore, it's just a, you know, slowing stuff down at the outside. You see the same thing in protostellar jets. So I just want to put up a few slides on AGN here points, just to say this is not theory, it's just looking at you know, kind of homology. So this is a paper by Um, just put salt in your oven. I want to have a high state of the So there's a mission here. Uh, this is in steel, if I remember. Yeah, in steel. Um, out to 2,000 kilometers a second, and, and then there's the steel in the part of the body of the galaxy. And, and their claim is that you see the steel moving out at the high velocities, and I forget what the radio is doing, so it's a lot of And then they tried to estimate the mass loss rate you win, which is, which is a, there's a discussion about error bars here at some level, right? And this is a lot of plot with circles should probably be more clear. Because the uncertainties in the mass loss rates are high, but fine. So this is the momentum, you know, P dot. Um, and they're comparing it here to L over C. So if L over C is right here, one to one, and they're getting things that are more like 20 to one. And you know, this is pretty good evidence that this stuff's definitely not just right It's driven by something else. Um, and the likely thing you get is just like these galactic winds driven by hot gas. It's the same sort of problem. Yeah. However, they are molecular, right? And you can see it down into the disk. So you got molecular gas the whole way. Um, so in that sense, the public being momentum driven are not the result of heating the gas up thermally. To whatever you need to get a thousand kilometers a second and driving the wind that way. Right? They're not energy driven in that sense. Right? They're driven by something pushing on the cold gas. They're, they're not momentum conserving because the hot gas dumps more momentum as long as you decline it a bit. Just like a super. But when you're actually pushing on this stuff, pushing on it, warps. Not by heating it up, not like a soul. Um, you can also drive outflows by radio disks. This is a, this is a, a few uh, images of 3C298, which is a 3C, so it's a long quasar. Um, what I'm showing here is this is actually a merge, maybe from the back, you can't see it, there's another galaxy up here. Uh, there's um, ionized gas emission here, and then this is the plot of the this is red shifted and blue shifted, so this, and you probably can't see it as well. I'll get this contours and show the check. But the, the velocity dispersion gets up to several hundred kilometers a second in the ionized gas. But on the bottom frame, I'm showing the CO emission. So this is Alma. And you do see CO emission down here around the black hole where the jet is. And it's also got a high velocity dispersion. So it's carbon monoxide and electric gas, and the velocity dispersion is a couple hundred kilometers a second. So now never mind pushing out the entraining gas, this is stuff sitting in a disk with two and a plumber per second velocity dispersion and it's a ton. So that's not really useful. Cool. Shocks between the plumber per second a bit well above about 10 to 6, 10 to 7, somewhere in there, but this doesn't like it. So we'll do there's a lot of gas in this thing. Alright. Now this gets back to the point at the end of the cylinder's discussion. There's plenty of energy in these staging outflows. And if you shock the gas, there's plenty of momentum after you find the gas to push the stuff out 20 times L per C. But coupling it to the ISM is not obvious. How you do it? Right. So here's some simulations um, from the fire group. Uh, I'm part of that. So feel free not to believe any of this. Um, so this is a based on view of gas, and there's an edge on view. And this is just star formation. Uh, and you can see this, the star formation tends to blow the ISM out and down in the center, and this is 10 parsecs, and that's what a lot of star formation is. Um, but there's still plenty of gas down in the center. 
Now you turn on a quasar, and the feedback loop put in is just a broad absorption line. You just put it in by hand, right? Just shoot particles out of 10 or 20,000 kilometers a second with some a mass loss rate given by L over C, essentially. And yeah, it blows a hole in the center of the galaxy, but it vents out the top and the bottom. Uh, right, that's 10 parsecs, so it's maybe it gets out to a lot of different generals, right? But it doesn't disrupt the gas in the pits. Oh. Is this thermal energy or is it uh, radiation pressure pushing? No, it's not radiation pressure, it's a, it's a kinetic wind. It's a wind. Yeah. It's, a broad, it's our version of a broad absorption of wind. Okay. So, so it's, it's not uh, thermal energy, it's the gas shocks against the bias depth, and then now you've got a very hot gas, which should act like a bomb, it does, right? It really blows out the center there. But then it's just vents, so you don't get stuff moving out to kill parsec scale. Not surprising, I mean, the disk is you know, really thin. Right? So once you get above the disk scale height, you just get out. Well, it does what super bubbles, it does what super bubbles do, all exactly. super bubbles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But super bubbles don't move the gas from the galaxy. Oh, this is not a killer. This is not a killer. It's not four It's not. It's not a merger, that's what I'd say. It's, it's a Euler in the sense that the star formation rate is necessarily high. So in that sense, it's Euler. It's not a Euler in the sense you're using it where, where it's a merger, you dump a ton of gas in there, and you completely bury the aging in the black hole. But I think what your point was right is you'll blow out that stuff there down in the center. You'll confine it better than this is going to find. But it's not obvious you can blow stuff out of the parts. And the gas removal times are short, but there's plenty of gas out of several kiloparsecs. You've got to get that stuff out as well. You have to blow that out without having to be fine. Because the scale height isn't in the cell kill parcels. So it's not clearly going to happen. Alright, so conclusions are more or less not done. Alright, so first of all, just an observation. Many of these winds have, appear to have mass and momentum rates, which you see L over C. Good. That's just not direct radiation pressure. Some of them do have momentum and mass loss rates of order LC. They could be momentum. Probably they are some of them. BAL winds aren't quite like being momentum. They're not obviously directly radiation driven, but it could be shock BALs or some sort of bomb like that. Okay. Supernova are neither momentum nor energy conserved. And they, they seem to me at least to be the best bet for Starburst generally. I didn't really go into this, but I've done some calculations. Certainly in disks of galaxies, magnetically driven winds don't move. The secretion rate through the disk is comparable to star formation rate, which is comparable to the mass loss rate in winds, and there's not enough energy in it. It's an energy It's not like black holes where you get more and more energy closer and closer to the center. But the potential in galaxies is just not this. Uh, jet driven outbolts are certainly seen in clusters and in quasars. And in cosmic ray driven winds, uh, the evidence to me is definitely not. Thank you. Is there a previous for questions? All questions. Like I said, I want to make the point that how gas can be listed by hot gas. Talk a lot about shocks pushing stuff. It becomes a mystery, like how can you shock it and have it? Um, but when you create uh, this hot outflow, you're making a bubble which then rises, and there can be an updraft behind it. Well, no, I, shock. I totally agree with you in the context of cluster. So, so you're talking well, about well above the disk or the sun. Well, I'm, I'm also talking about in the disk of a you know, Milky Way like galaxy. If you create a bubble, like the current bubble that rises, you're going to create, you know, a uh, pressure. Yeah, you know, fair enough. Uh, no, I agree. But if you talk about out of the disk itself, at uh, three kiloparsecs, well, and whatever it is now sitting out of the disk is going to rush up underneath it. Yeah. And so what matters is, is you use that phase stuff gets pulled up, and it may be multi phase. Right? You're not necessarily pulling up in liquid clouds, but the ambient, you know, eight to <coughs> one, ten to four, ten to fifth, three gas. Yeah, but the, the so you're relying on buoyancy to pull stuff up. Uh, well, buoyancy, but also, you know, the cavity, you know, the buoyancy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, that's well, buoyancy. Well, cavity needs buoyancy. Well, uh, yeah. But the pressure in that gas above the disk is well below the pressure in the disk. Right. Right. So, uh, 
buoyancy doesn't really work for you very well. The gas is as much hotter than the gas in the pit, so that's the only difference. The energy gradients. I think that's what I'm saying. It's, it's when you create, uh, when you were to change the pressure range, it's going to help well. I think that's probably not true. It is true once you get up into the CGM above the disk, right? But you're not, you know, I'm talking about right off the disk. That would be a uh, fundamental stuff. In my simulations, I always find this gas in a big bit, as we mentioned just uh, in my, uh, yeah, uh, the exact thing you mentioned. So I will uh, really show some simulations.